Hey, folks. Can everybody hear me? All right. Are back? All right. All right. Welcome to Science on Tap, folks. I think we're uh, we're in for a, a treat tonight. I see some new faces, so I'm going to take a moment just to talk a little bit about Science on Tap and what what the program is here. Um, we're really trying to, to offer a chance for researchers and scientists in the valley and, and from western Montana to come and, and have a real down-to-earth conversation about their work. So it's an opportunity to both um, practice a little science communication and get people involved in, in, in learning about what kind of research is going around, uh, on around the valley and in western Montana in particular. And uh, it's a real laid-back atmosphere if you haven't, haven't pulled that, that out of the air yet. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a, a few things you should know. First off, every beer sold, we get a dollar of the proceeds donated to split between the Flathead uh, Lake Biological Station and the Flathead Lakers. So we're, I like to say we're drinking for cause. Um, <laughs> I encourage you to, in, in light of that, I encourage you to ask your waitress during the, the presentation if you need a refill, don't be shy, flag her down, they're well trained. Um, they know what's going on, and it's not an inconvenience at all. Um, we really hope that what what makes Science on Tap great, I think, is is the fact that we have an engaged audience. So I, I, I think that everybody here is here because they're interested in the story, and we encourage you to ask questions. Um, we'll have a short presentation, shortish presentation, and then a question and answer session. So. Um, it's really up to the presenter if they want to take questions during or if they want everybody to hold off. Um, we'll find that out as we go here. Um, I think that, that it's important to understand that, that this is really for everybody's benefit and to really, really get, get a lot out of it. So please do, if you have a question, fire away and ask. At, uh, don't be bashful. Um, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Hillary Devlin from the Flathead Lakers for a moment here. Good evening. I just wanted to mention a couple of things now that the weather hopefully is turning and it's spring and summer's coming. Um, early bird registration for our third annual poker paddle is up and going until um, the end of May. And so if there are any paddlers um, <laughs> with information, um, we also need lots of volunteers for the poker paddle. So if you are not a paddler but just want to spend a beautiful day, hopefully not raining day, <laughs> on the lake, um, we would love to have you. We are also having about 450 students coming to the biological station uh, this month over four days. And I need help, I need volunteers, so if you're interested in just hanging out with the kids, it's an inspiring day, it's really wonderful, um, and I need your help. So please contact me. Um, you can find information for both the Poker Paddle and the um, field trips on our website, and um, we would love to have you. We also have um, a 5K run in Lakeside in August, and our annual meeting is the 26th, 26th. So if you're planning your July calendar, put it on there. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll reinforce that. Do we have uh, any Flathead Laker members in the audience? All right, I'll raise my hand. If you're not a Flathead Lakers member, you should talk to somebody who just raised their hand and find out what being a member means and, and really look into it. Um, now that I've plugged Hillary's organization, I will say that the Flathead Lake Biological Station, uh, we're doing some, a lot this summer as well. We have a full house, I'd say, for our summer session program, and uh, we're going to have a, a whole slew of undergraduates running around and, and traversing the valley and the mountains here to learn all about uh, ecology and, and the lake and all sorts of stuff. So we have an open house, I think it's the fourth. Jim, is that right? Ish? Third? All right. So we'll have an open house later in the summer and uh, please come and check us out out in Yellow Bay. All right, we'll get going. Hit all the bases, good. All right, again, laid back atmosphere, order a beer and uh, enjoy. I'm really excited about the presentation tonight. Uh, we're going to hear about, I think we have the closest thing to a Woody Allen-esque title as we've come along and what no one ever told you. It's close enough to everything you want to know but we're afraid to ask, right? Um, I, I think that I like the title. It's really great. So we're really pleased to have Diana Six from the University of Montana here to discuss Pine Beetle. All right. Thank you. Just 
Um, I'm not used to using a microphone, so I will try to get used to it. Um, it's really nice to be here. Uh, this is a great concept, Science on Tap. Um, beer and science actually do go together very, very well. Um, I found that true throughout my entire career. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I'm glad you came. Um, I really uh, want to thank you for showing up, especially um, because the mountain pine beetle has been a topic for a very long time. Oh, I'm not close enough. Okay. Um, I do want to thank everyone for showing up because the mountain pine beetle has been kind of an ongoing topic for a very long time. And so I get worried sometimes people are getting really burnt out, you know, they want to hear something else. Um, so that was in part um, why I titled the talk the way I did tonight. Um, I want to give you some information, hopefully, that you haven't heard. But I also think that the information I'm going to provide um, is not only just hopefully interesting, but a value in looking at how um, beetles affect our forests, why they're doing what they do, and um, try to give you some information that maybe you don't get uh, in the newspaper and stuff. Um, you'll hear a lot of different things in the newspaper, but it's sort of the same repeat all the time. And so what I want to do is give you some other information about this insect that I think will help you understand kind of the complexity and uh, um, kind of the, the difficult situation that we have faced with our forests with these insects. So um, in order to actually um, tell you what you haven't heard, I have to sort of guess what you have heard. Um, and I'm going to guess that you heard that they have killed a lot of trees, that they have developed outbreaks due to unhealthy forests, that the outbreaks are cyclic, that you can actually beetle-proof a stand by thinning it, and that beetles kill trees with blue-stained fungi. How many people have seen the really beautiful wood that everybody's making stuff with? You'll hear a lot of stories that these fungi that they carry are how they kill trees. Um, and also, another common thing that you'll read is that a cold snap can end an outbreak. And so hopefully by the end of the talk today, you'll be able to figure out for yourself which ones of these things actually are true. Um, start off with the basics. Um, mountain pine beetle. It has a really kind of descriptive scientific name. Good scientific names are very descriptive. Um, this one is Dendroctinus ponderosi. Dendro means tree, and tonus means destroyer. So pretty dramatic, but pretty accurate. <laughs> and ponderosi means destroyer of ponderosa pines. And that was eh, not quite so good. Um, ponderosa, they do kill ponderosa when they're really stressed by drought. But what they really like are lodge poles, and unfortunately also white bark pine now. Um, but really, most any other pine will do in certain circumstances. Now, you'll hear from um, you know, when you read in the newspaper, they'll describe, you know, mountain pine beetles, they are about the grain of rice or something. Um, I actually describe them more like a mouse bird. Um, <laughs> and um, actually, one of these is a mouse turd. <laughs> so if you look up here, that is a mouse turd, and that is a beetle. So I think my description is a lot better than the newspaper reporter. And you've got to admit that, you know, something this tiny, isn't it kind of shocking that they have killed literally millions and millions of trees? But something this little can do so much. And so hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll have a kind of a good idea how, how that can happen. Um, I'm going to take you briefly through their life cycle. And I'm not going to do that just because I'm a professor and I like to do that to people. But it really is actually important to understand the life cycle of organisms so you're going to understand how they operate out there. And I think it's especially important with this insect. So I'm going to start up here with this... Whoa. Uh, look at where it says number one. <laughs> um, you'll see the little beetle up there flying. Um, she has just left the tree that she grew up in and developed, and now she has to go find another tree that she can attack and, in order to have food to raise her young. And so she'll fly off, she'll find a new tree, she'll land on it, and then using a combination of chemical cues, 
she will decide if that's the correct tree to bore into. Beta bark beetles really sense their environment almost completely chemically. And so she'll smell the tree, she'll taste it, and the different chemicals in the tree will tell her if it's a lodgepole pine, or maybe it's a dug fir, and she shouldn't even go in there. But somehow she'll figure out this is the right kind of tree, she'll begin to bore in. But as you can imagine, this little mouse turd sized insect can't really kill a living big defensive tree. Trees are absolutely full of defenses. So they have resin, and I can't point, but you can see that <laughs> the resin go out there. When beetles bore in, they sever these resin canals, and it creates this pitch flow that pushes them out. And it can also drown them. And so they're facing a very dangerous situation. And so this beetle, when she bores in, has to get help. And so she releases a pheromone that is highly attractive, and any other mountain pine beetles that are flying around in the area pick up on that pheromone and they will come in to the tree. And if she's really lucky and she can attract hundreds, maybe even thousands, they can bore enough holes into that tree to drain it of resin. But they're not home free yet. Once they get under the bark, that tree can sense that they're being uh, attacked and begin to produce high levels of monoterpenes. So when you walk around the forest or you cut down a tree or something, you smell all that beautiful pine odor, those are natural insecticides and fungicides. <laughs> Sorry to ruin that for you. But <laughs> my students just hate that. Um, You've ruined Christmas for me. Uh, it's, it's not going to kill you, it's fine. But the beetles are not, it's not good for them. But they produce higher concentrations of this stuff, and that can also be toxic. But if they get enough attacks, they can finally overwhelm the tree. And what's really kind of interesting here is the beetles can sense when that happens. We can't tell. Um, there's a, kind of this point of no return the trees hit that they just won't recover and they quit fighting. And the beetles sense this and they switch from making this pheromone that attracts beetles to one that repels them. And that's a really kind of clever thing to do because if they keep attracting beetles, there's going to be too many in the tree and there won't be enough resources for their young. So they have a way of cooperating as long as they need to and then shutting it off as soon as they don't need to. So I keep trying to use this pointer. I'm not going to do it. Um, so they'll get under the bark finally once the tree has kind of given up the ghost and they'll begin to bore this tunnel. And as they do this, the female will lay eggs. And then at the same time, they do something else. And that is to introduce fungi into the tree. So if you look up in that top picture up there, you'll see this little hole. That's actually the opening of a little pocket on their mouth part. It's called a mycangium. And it functions like a fungal suitcase. And so in these pockets, they carry fungi that they then carry into the tree. And if you look at that stuff that's kind of oozing out of the opening, that's actually the fungus. These pockets are really remarkable. They have these glands inside that produce a substance that actually feeds the fungus so that it grows. And so it's kind of growing out of the opening and as they crawl along those tunnels, it just scrapes off onto the tree surface. And then these fungi grow out into the phloem, which is this layer under the bark where the beetles live. But in, unlike the beetles, which are kind of trapped in this little thin layer under the bark, the fungi can actually also grow deep into the sapwood. And when they get into the sapwood, these fungi do something really remarkable. They gather up all the nitrogen that's in there, and then they pump it back out to where those larvae are feeding. And that allows the beetles to get enough nitrogen to be able to develop. Uh, so increases the nitrogen something like 40%. And when you're an insect that is really desperate for nitrogen, that's a huge amount. Um, for some insects, if you raise the nitrogen like 2 or 3%, you get a population explosion. And so this actually helps the insect be able to use trees as food when otherwise they would probably starve to death. So they continue to feed in the form. And this takes about a year, 
finally they'll turn into an adult, but they don't. Am I going in and out too much to annoy people? Am I doing this okay? All right. Um, so they'll turn into adult, but they don't leave the tree right away. They actually stay in these little chambers up there where you can see them full of white stuff. Those are actually the spores of the fungi. And they feed on those spores. And that serves two purposes. One, it allows them to pack their fungal suitcases so that they have these fungi to carry to the next tree to their young. Because if they don't, their young actually starve to death. And the other is that something about feeding on these spores allows the beetles to reproduce. If they don't feed on those spores, the females don't make eggs. And we think that's related to the fungi producing a compound called ergosterol that they can use for reproductive hormones. So it's a really, really tight, very obligate association, and neither the fungi nor the beetles can live without the others. So that's kind of what happens in a tree. But what happens on the landscape? Well, this is an example of what has been happening on our landscape. <laughs> if it was full, I would have stolen it from <laughs> She's safe. <laughs> um, but this is a, a map of the current outbreak. And it's pretty astonishing to see it. This was up until 2013. It's gotten a little bigger since then. Um, but it's pretty impressive. Um, it's way outside of the historic norm. Um, it's something like 10 times bigger than any previous outbreak that we've seen. It would be impressive if it was double, but it's 10 times bigger. And it's also different in a number of ways. And this is where I could really use a pointer. Um, but if you look up in British Columbia, which got hit really, really hard, and you go up about three quarters of the way up that red blob, the beetle never used to occur above that point because it was just too cold. And now it's warm enough that it's not only allowed the beetle to spread several hundred mile, um, kilometers further north, but in full outbreak status. And this is again only up to 2013, and the beetle has actually now moved all the way up into the Yukon, which is pretty astonishing. I know I came late, but are we allowed to ask questions during your presentation, or would you rather wait? I'd rather you okay. wait, but if you have a burning one right now. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I, when I take them during, yeah. we'll be here three hours. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so it has really moved further north, just because it's warmer. But something else that's really kind of scary and remarkable is you can kind of see where the Rockies go up through British Columbia. That red area on the east side, the beetle has never occurred there until just the last few years. So what happened was kind of the convergence of a couple of events. We had this big outbreak in British Columbia with literally billions and billions of beetles flying. You can see these dark clouds. You should get on YouTube and look at this stuff. It's mind-boggling. And then we had a couple of wind events that blew billions of beetles over the crest of the Rockies, dumped them on the other side. And in the past, this probably wouldn't have had any effect because that interior portion is very, very cold. But it is warm sufficiently now to support these beetle populations. And as you can see, they're big. It's an outbreak on that that area, and they are also moving. They have now moved all the way across Alberta. They're moving into Saskatchewan. And, hmm, okay, you can't see this, but <laughs> um, where it says boreal forest, you should be able to see kind of a big light, light green blob. Um, the beetle has actually moved now into the boreal forest, and it's never been there before. And the boreal forest is made up, uh, a lot of it, of jack pine. And so this is a tree species that the beetle has never been in before. It's now in a new place it's never been before. So essentially now, we can probably consider it an exotic. And this is a concern, because if you look at the range of jack pine, you can see that it extends clear across the continent. And so the fear is now that this beetle will continue to keep moving through this boreal forest, into the Great Lakes, over into our eastern pine forests and down the east coast. Um, and it is now moving actually faster than the models predict, so 
We're not really sure what's going to happen, but this boreal forest is a really important forest worldwide for a whole number of reasons. So this is a, a pretty big concern. The beetle has also expanded its range, not just north and east, but higher in elevation. And so this is a little closer to home. This is white bark pine. Uh, this is our high elevation species. Um, and this is what it looks like in a lot of places. This is, what the, this is the Tetons. This is what it looks like in the high elevations there. If you go to Yellowstone, more than a million acres of the high elevation white bark pine have already been killed. And again, it's because it's now warmer in the high elevations and the beetles are now up there and continuing to kill trees. Um, what, um, now, <laughs> sorry, getting my trees and beetles mixed up. Um, mountain pine beetle has actually been in white bark pine before. We know it got up there in the Dust Bowl era in a couple of our bigger warm droughts, but it's always been shoved back off the mountain as soon as things went back to being cold and wet again. The problem is now we have this chronic warming, the beetles are pretty much up there to stay, so they've just continued to kill trees. And the mortality, as you can see, is pretty devastating. Um, it's so bad now that actually the tree is recommended for listing as an endangered species. I give such upbeat talks. <laughs> I gotta work on something else. I think. Um, there is a little bit of good stuff there. <laughs> uh, so I've kind of talked about the beetles in an individual tree, kind of on a really big landscape level. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about how the beetle can transform from being in these very low non-outbreak populations to an outbreak scale. So how does that happen? Um, believe it or not, they are usually present in our forest in very, very low numbers. Um, when I was, I've been working on it for about 25 years, and when I started, an outbreak had just collapsed, of course, and I couldn't find anything to do research on. So I spent weeks trying to find trees to cut down and take back to the lab. They were really hard to find. And that's the way they typically are, most of the time, decades. But every once in a while, you get a trigger. And for mountain pine beetle, that trigger, what starts an outbreak, is warm and dry. So why is that? Warm actually supports um, greater survival, greater reproduction, so that just kind of combines to mean you end up with more beetles. And drought and dry is super important because that means you've got trees that are struggling to get enough moisture, they're not vigorous, and so they're not making those resin and monoterpene defenses they need to fight the beetles. So you end up with a lot of trees across huge areas. When you have a drought, this is not local, it's usually regional. So you end up with trees across big areas that are not defending themselves, but you're getting more trees. And this sort of acts together to get the populations rolling. Once they reach over a threshold, which is what that straight line is up there, once their numbers get to that size, there are so many on the landscape that they can actually now overcome the defenses of even healthy trees. And then that outbreak is off and running. And once it gets rolling like that, there's really nothing you can do as long as the underlying conditions are present that support them. And so you end up typically with one of two outcomes. One is like this red one at the top, British Columbia, and some of our areas. It basically runs to completion. They kill all of the larger diameter trees. They need the bigger ones because they need a thicker floor like foam layer. And little trees don't have that. So they kill all of the trees that are appropriate size and the species they need. And then they poop out because they've just basically run out of food. The other possibility is that you have a return to wetter, cooler conditions. The beetles are not surviving as well. The trees are beginning to defend themselves, and the populations are going to find. The problem is that, of course, we're in a period where we're seeing more warming and drying, and so this particular outbreak, instead of ending after five or seven or ten years, has continued for more than 20. And so now we see this, this massive outbreak. Okay, I get asked this all the time. <laughs> Every 
here, as soon as we get something below zero, all the TV stations call me and say, so did this do it? <laughs> and I go, no, just like I told you last year, uh, <laughs> and the year before. Um, cold snaps in the middle of winter do not do much to the beetles, and there's a very good reason for it. In the fall, as soon as it starts getting a little cool, they begin to stop growing, they dump a lot of water out of their bodies, and they replace it with antifreeze. <laughs> Literally. It's very, very similar in chemical structure to what we put in our cars. And they can survive at minus 40 for several days, and you know, we just don't even get that. In fact, in the old days, we didn't get that. So once they're ready for winter, they're really ready for winter. Um, the cold snaps that really have a good effect and can really knock them back are in the spring and in the fall. So if they're in the spring, they're not quite, they, they come out of winter and they're not dormant, they don't, they're antifreeze, they're vulnerable. And just a little bit below freezing will kill them. Same thing in the fall, if you get an early one and they haven't made enough antifreeze yet, you can get a lot of beetle kill. But will that end an outbreak? And the sad truth is, no, it won't. <laughs> um, we watched this several times. Um, most recently in the big hole, we get an early frost in October. Killed 95% of the beetles from our best estimates. The next year, no beetles. Next year, no, there's a few pockets. The next year, full blown again. As long as you've got underlying conditions and warm and dry, they'll come back. And so, unfortunately, the cold snaps alone can help, but they don't do it all. Um, the mountain pine beetle outbreak, you probably have noticed or heard, is collapsing, which is a good thing, finally. Um, and like, a lot of people will ask me, why is this occurring? Well, in some places, especially in lodgepole pine, it's been host depletion. They've killed all of the big, suitable trees and they basically run out of a lot of the food. In whitebird pine, we're not totally sure, but it has crashed out in most of those areas. Uh, it does appear that cold snaps there in fall have helped. Um, we're not sure if they're going to pick back up, but having a nice and wet year like this um, should help out. So. Um, but I, <laughs> are we out of the woods yet? You know, I, I guess I shouldn't use terms like that. But um, I'm not sure. Um, I think we are for a while with mountain pine beetle, but we have to realize there's a whole bunch of other bark beetles out there. And right now we're seeing a big upswing in western pine beetle, which goes after ponderosa. Uh, just had to cut down some of my neighbor's trees um, uh, this weekend, which I quickly took home for a research project. Um, Douglas fir beetle is starting to pick up. Um, Ips, which is pine engraver, is starting to pick up. And so, you know, we may see other beetles uh, come in as well. It's just a wait and see. Um, so what can we do? I get this kind of a question a lot. And I don't know. We don't have any good answers. Um, it's a really difficult insect to manage. But I think it really is time for us to start using some new tools and some new approaches. Um, we have tried to, for decades, and in Europe with their beetles for centuries, to try to kill the beetle. And we haven't been successful because we can't address the actual cause. All we can do is go out and treat the symptoms. So the only way we could probably really manage is if there's some way we could turn down the temperature or increase the rainfall. And those are things we can't do. So what can we do? Um, well, I think it's time for us to start looking at the trees instead of looking at the beetles. So I want to talk in this last part of the talk about some research that we're doing in my lab, trying to look at what we can learn from the trees and if that might help us find some way to deal with the beetles, especially since we're expecting more and more problems. So. Um, in order to get a new way of looking at trees, um, I'd like to introduce kind of the old way of looking at trees. Um, this is how we usually look at a stand of trees when we look at trees or when we manage. And that is that trees are pretty much all the same. Um, they might be a little bigger, they might be a little smaller, 
but pretty much we treat them as the same, almost like they're clones, and that their responses are going to be very similar. And so let's say this is a, and it is, a stand of ponderosa pine. It's pretty dense, it's probably had a lot of fire suppression, maybe we want to go in and thin it. We will go in and mark trees, um, we want a certain size distribution and spacing, and then we go in and thin, and we develop a structure that we would like to see. I would argue that we need to start looking at trees a little bit differently. And that is sort of taking a genetic approach. Um, when a beetle looks at a forest, they're gonna see trees as very, very different individuals. For us, we can't really do that very easily. But something that's really important to realize is that trees are not all the same. They have incredible degrees of genetic diversity. In fact, some of the highest on the planet, which means that they have a really high capacity to have a lot of different responses. So if we were to look at a stand of trees, not as just some are bigger and some are littler, but, and mostly the same, if we try to think of this as a sea of human faces, like I'm looking out at you right now, I see a huge amount of diversity. Everybody looks different, everybody's got different um, expressions, they're gonna have different responses. If we look at trees, we can realize that way, we can realize that they also have this. But we have to have a way to recognize it. Because trees don't have faces and we aren't capable of seeing them like beetles. So we're trying to use genetic approaches to be able to do that. We want to see the forest the way the beetles see the forest. And so, one of the things that we're doing is trying to use these forests that have already been affected by climate change and by beetles to teach us something about what um, contributes to the potential for our forests to move forward in a warming and drying climate and under increasing beetle pressure. So when I work in these forests, this is a white bark pine forest. This is only about three years after the outbreak started. It goes really fast in white bark because they don't defend themselves very much. After another couple of years, these stands had 95 to 98 percent kill of the mature trees. And when you walk around, you really do feel like everything is dead. And I was getting very discouraged, as you can imagine. But then after several years, because I'm a slow learner sometimes, um, you know, I started to really pay attention and realize that here and there, there were these big trees, white barks, the right size that the beetles prefer, and they were perfectly fine. And it just really kind of blew me away because I didn't think there was any possibility that they could have just escaped by chance. Because if you think about it, when these beetles are in peak populations, they have killed almost everything. And there's billions of them flying around, and they're absolutely desperate to find somewhere to go. There's just nothing left. Yet they didn't touch these trees. So I started thinking, okay, I've got to figure out what's different about these trees. Maybe there's something about these trees that gives them a chance to reproduce and maybe replace these really devastated forests. So what we're doing is, oh, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> I had a couple hypotheses as to why these trees survived. And these are what they are. One is that these survivors may be pre-adapted to warmer, drier conditions. And so when they get hit with this kind of uh, new climate, they are not struggling. And so they still have defenses. And maybe the beetles just don't go in because they are still healthy and not defensive. But that has a genetic basis. The other possibility is that these trees might just have a very different chemical profile. Maybe genetically they code for some different terpenes or different abundances. And again, remember the beetles sense their environment chemically. If these are different enough, the beetles might not even recognize them as food or might even be repelled. And so these are things that we're looking at right now. And we're doing this not just in white bark pine, but also live coal and uh, ponderosa. I worked on this last night because the graph was really confusing. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, it's better. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> oh, 
Um, I will explain. <laughs> um, so we go into these stands where we have some big survivors and we have a lot of dead. And then we also have these other trees, which have, we call a general population. And they happen to be trees that are just a tiny bit too small for the beetles to attack. Beetles have to have a certain size tree in order to get enough food out of them, and they'll ignore smaller trees. So we have these smaller trees that survive just because they weren't big enough to kill. We're hoping that that general population is representative of the genetic makeup of the population without beetle pressure. So it should contain, if there are genotypes that are distinct for survivors, it should contain some survivors and a bunch of susceptible trees. And then we have the survivors, which are the ones that actually did survive the beetle pressure. Okay? So what we've done, and I can't point, but up there's a big S, those are our bigger survivors, and from those trees, we take four measures. Um, we take needles from which we extract DNA to do the genetic profiles, which you can see here. We t measure resin flow, so a measure of how defensive they are, if they produce a lot of resin or just a little. We take tree cores, that allows us to see year by year how they've responded to climate, so how do they do when it's dry, and how have they done in recent years. And we also, I'm missing something here, chemical profiles, thank you. <laughs> we take foam samples and analyze their chemical profile. We do that for the general population trees as well, and for the dead trees, because they don't have any resin or any of the stuff left, needles even, we can only take the cores, but then we can compare their growth rates with the trees that survive to see if they actually are struggling more than those that survive. So it's a really nice kind of system because we can develop the genetic profile and then see if the resin flow is related to certain profiles or growth rates and see if that corresponds to survivorship. And we haven't we haven't gotten our chemical analysis back from the lab yet, so I can't share that. The resin flow is sort of ambiguous. The tree rings we're still working on, but I can share with you our first results, and these are preliminary for the genetic analysis. And for now, all this can do is tell us whether we can detect with our method whether the survivors are different from the main part of the general population, which is what we really are hoping because if the survivors are different genetically, that means this is a heritable trait they can pass on, which is a good thing. Okay, another gnarly one. I couldn't make this any easier. Um, <laughs> but it's not that bad. What this is is a tree, and what it does is it puts things together. Every one of these little survivor general is an individual tree of these 66 trees in our first data set. And it clumps them together by who's most similar. And so you can see that the ones with the orange around them are survivors. And we have two branches that clump the survivors together. And we have two branches that clump the general population together. And there are a few general population ones that are in the survivors, but you'd expect that because when they grew up, maybe they would have been a survivor. So what this is saying is there is some genetic differences we can distinguish between these two groups. And this is really encouraging, but it's also preliminary, and it's only 66 trees from one site. But um, it's encouraging that we may be on to something. So we're gonna continue the work with the tree rings, the chemical profiles, and then, because this has been so encouraging, we're hoping to go to a full genomic approach where we actually look at the genomes of these trees and look to see what genes might be responsible for these trees surviving. Um, the nice thing about genetics right now is that unlike in the past, it's becoming a lot easier, a lot cheaper, and a lot more practical. And so that means that this actually could become something applicable in management within just a few years. A few years ago, that was not the case. And so to me, this gives us hope that there may be some way to find that we can restore some white bark pine, but also work with our lodgepole pine forests and ponderosa pine forests um, to help them 
um, to forest adaptation to, to climate change. Um, so I will conclude because I've been talking a long time and I need a beer. Um, so this, this insect is actually, I think, as you hopefully will agree, a lot more complex than a lot of people have given it credit for. It's also um, a lot more difficult to manage than I think a lot of people um, have known in the past. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of new thinking and new tools and new approaches to deal with it. Um, and I have beetle capitalized up here because it's not just mountain pine beetle. We've got all these other ones um, that we're going to have to deal with at some point. So anyway, with that I'll end and I would love to take some questions. because of their mating systems and so forth. Um, I think with CRISPR and a lot of the technologies now, that's probably feasible. Um, I think I myself would not like to see that done. Um, not that I'm totally anti-genetic engineering, because I'm not, um, but it is a natural disturbance. Um, and it is necessary for helping our forests regenerate and keeping them functional. It's just that it's out of whack now because of a lot of things that are going on, particularly warming. Um, I think the way to think about it maybe is that if we could remove fire, because it's a disturbance agent, would that be good? If we tried to do it, it hasn't been good. I think it wouldn't be good with the beetle either. Um, mosquitoes, I, 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 I actually support the approach because I think when you have that kind of a big threat to human health, um, that it's appropriate. Not necessarily my opinion with the Beatles, but I think it probably would be feasible. A lot of things are going to be feasible. We're going to have to think really hard whether we should do it. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I have three questions. Great. Um, yeah. one, one is. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, in, in a lot of south, south exposures, we have ponderosa pines, but in the other exposures, we have a lot of um, Douglas fir. Um, and, um, and so I wondered how this relates to the Douglas fir beetle issue. Um, I wanted uh, to see if you could comment on the pheromones, um, both the MCH caps for the uh, Douglas fir and the verbenone. Uh, for the um, pines, and, um, uh, and I can't remember the third one. I'll never remember three either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to do this with my professors. I'd skip the middle one. I never noticed. But um, so yeah, Doug fur beetle is starting to pick up, and I noticed you guys have some around the lake. It is a different kind of beetle. It's an easier one to manage. Um, and it's, a, it, it's not one that usually builds the massive outbreaks because it's not as aggressive. Um, it is a strong responder to stress. So if you see drought stress, you can see an uptick. But any time that the trees get a little bit healthy, the beetles crash out. That's not the case with mountain pine beetle. Um, with Doug fir beetle, it's also easier to manage with the pheromones. MCH is really effective and it's cheap, um, which is nice. And you can't say that about any other bark beat, I don't think, that you have something that effective and that isn't going to kill you to pay for it. Um, mountain pine beetle, on the other hand, the verbenone is not very effective. It works if you have very low populations of beetles. Uh, it works among creeks because you have no other choice. Um, you can't use pesticides or anything. It's, highly, it's really expensive. Um, the beetles are now flying twice as long as they used to, and so you have to put it out twice a year, and at 30 bucks a tree, well, 60 a tree per season, 
Um, for only 60% efficacy, it's kind of dismal. Um, but with the Doug Fur Beetle, MCH is awesome. It's very cheap, and I recommend that highly. So if you guys are worried about the beetles, you know, that's a good way to go right now. <laughs> so, so you, you mentioned there are some uh, ways that we can thin the forest um, to uh, reduce the um, beetle being encouraged to come into our particular forest. Um, can you tell us about, about thinning densities for the different tree varieties that would be recommended um, to reduce the probability of a beetle being attracted to our particular forest? I was really hoping nobody would ask that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thinning. Thinning has been pushed as kind of a cure-all for beetles. They used to call it beetle proofing until the outbreak when it found out that it fails. Um, so thinning does work in helping your stands become more vigorous. Um, and so if you don't have high populations of beetles, it can help you avoid problems. And it's good for a lot of other reasons. Okay? Um, fire control and a lot of things. And with ponderosas, it's really good. Release drought stress, which is going to be a big thing. Um, I don't know the densities. They're different for different areas, so I would suggest talking to a local, a local forest service person or something. Um, make sure you talk to somebody reputable. Some people just want to cut down your trees and get money for them. Um, so talk to somebody that's going to you know, do a good job. So, but I, I, you know, the thinning won't do it under an outbreak, but in regular times it, it does help. You want me? Oh, people in the other room. Yeah. Oh. That's why I have to repeat. People hiding in the bushes. So survivor tree number seventeen. It turns out to be. Um, genetically superior as far as resisting the beetle, now what? Do we go to pick a fence around it so nothing bothers it, collect the seeds, stuff like that? But noting that there are some few trees that have proved to be resistant, what good does that do other than knowing that they'll still be there to reproduce? That's going to depend on your species of tree. So like with white bark, there's a big push now to do restoration, and they're collecting seeds. Uh, and growing them out in nurseries and replanting them out to try and save the tree. Uh, this could perhaps, today, problem with fear of speaking, um, <laughs> the problem with um, the way they've been doing it is that there's no accounting for what's being planted out. And this may be able to kind of optimize the little money that's out there in plant trees that maybe are more likely to survive either in the future. I think we need to do some work on that. Um, with lodgepole pine, um, what we're hoping is that we can encourage people to not clear cut on the beetle kill. And so right now, typically after the beetles go through, they're going to cut down all of the trees and salvage. And so if we can get them to retain the green trees that have survived for reseeding, just natural regeneration, and leave a few of the dead ones around to keep them from blowing down because they need logical just blows down if you them stay on the so with some selective salvage and avoiding taking out these survivors, we may be able to increase the, the regeneration of these trees that may have that kind of resistance. But again, I, you know, I hate giving advice before we have the data. This is all really new. And there's a lot more to trees living on the landscape than surviving a beetle attack. There's a lot more of their genotype they need for other things. So I think we need to start looking at trees from a genetic aspect for a lot of things. But that's kind of been my my soapbox for the last you know couple of years is that we now have the tools to do this and we should do it. Did that answer your question? Was that too bad? Are there any creatures that eat the beetle that you can put out there and I do. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, go on to SciShow with Hank Green. The two episodes with him do the first one, and we talk about bark pesto. Um, but, <laughs> seriously. Um, I'll give you a serious answer in a minute. Um, but 
being an entomologist, and we get bored out in the field picking beetles out of trees, we decide to taste them once. And they're really good. The larvae taste like pine nuts. It's no surprise. It's like eating, right? And the adults, not so much, you know. Um, it's a larvae. So we actually mushed them up with basil and Hey, Greenhouse, you can take anything, but that's just about putting over the top. <laughs> But seriously, and we made beer from yeast from their little fungal suitcases too, which was actually pretty cool. They had a really going concern with the beer. Is it good? The first three yeasts we tried, who asked this? I did. You did. The first three yeasts were terrible. They were so bad. I was like, we're just wasting money. Bitter? Oh, bitter. And some tasted like copper, like oh. toxic. It was horrible. So we said, okay, we'll try one more. And it was great. We got like 4.5%, which is good for a white yeast. But yeah, there are a lot of things that, that eat beetles. Woodpeckers are our best, best friends that way. Yeah, <laughs> well, they go after the ants. Yeah. God, they're amazing. Yeah. But the Harry's and the Downies are really, really amazing. They can take 90% of the beetles out of the tree. There's little claret beetles that chase them down and rip their heads off and eat them. They're fun to watch. Um, and they're... they're <laughs> This just shows how weird entomologists are, but we caught a bunch of these predators and put them in these petri dishes with the beetles. And the clary beetles, something like 9 out of 10, they, they, it's like an osprey. They get their fish and they line it up. Well, they line their beetles up, they rip the head off, they rip the left wing cover off, and then the right one eat the rest of it. <laughs> and they always, 9 out of 10, take the left wing cover off first. <laughs> Never did publish. <laughs> uh, but they eat something like, oh, I don't know, seven or eight larvae, well, they're larvae, and seven or eight of also. There's quite a bit. There's all these other ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm oh, scared. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, um, but they just can't keep up. The beetles out reproduce all of it. So in, when the beetles are not in outbreak populations, they help keep them down. But once they hit over that threshold, there's so many beetles that they just can't keep up. So, so, so my students say, well, just put more woodpeckers out there. <laughs> oh, it's territorial. Yeah. Yeah. I also have a three-part question. <laughs> One, is white bark pine the same as white pine? No. Oh, <laughs> related. Two, uh, this slowdown of infestation locally, uh, is BC uh, experiencing the same slowdown? Yeah, but, I mean, if you look at that big red blob, there are some areas you get a plane and fly, 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 and fly. There's not a single tree alive. 80% of that huge problem. And thirdly, why does the western pine beetle need so much nitrogen? <laughs> Did you set him up? <laughs> You want to set phosphorus. Oh <laughs> um, everything, uh, animals need nitrogen, a lot of it. And wood has very, very little. And so it's a typical problem of any herbivorous insect, is how do I get enough nitrogen to build a body? They need it for proteins and structural, enzymatic. Um, they need a lot of nitrogen. And wood is probably one of the worst possible places you can go. And if you think about it, uh, a beetle is an animal, we're an animal, None, no animals are able to produce enzymes that break down cellulose or lignin, and that's 99, 98% of, of wood. And so they're living in non-food. Non and so they've got to get something else that can somehow get it for them. Termites. They have other things that do it for them as well. They've got protozoans and bacteria and so forth in their guts that do it. Yeah, anything that's eating wood has got somebody helping it.
Yeah, the question was, is there a difference in how the beetle kind of operates in old growth versus second growth that's been logged, right? Um, old growth can go down pretty fast because they like big diameter trees. Um, second growth, it depends on the size. If it's um, too small, they're not going to attack it. But if it's big enough, it's, it's as susceptible as the large trees. Used to think that the large trees had very few defenses, but that's turning out not necessarily to be true. It's more uh, a level of stress that's present. Is there any work on a fungicide? Uh, there has been a lot of people asking about, well, if the fungi are sort of their weak link, is there some, can we attack them through the fungus? The fungus is a lot tougher than the beetles. They're really hard to kill, and it's impossible to get it, a fungicide to spread all the way through the tree. And even if we could, then the beetles that are in that tree <laughs> wouldn't survive, and then they wouldn't transport this anymore. It would just be so expensive, and we can't figure out any way that it would actually even if you could get it to work, be kind of feasible, because all it would do is treat what's in one tree. Is there a relationship between fire suppression? Okay, the question was, is there a relationship between fire suppression and more vigorous bark beetle outbreaks? Um, fire suppression and denser forest does not create an outbreak, but you can have more severe damage in some of the suppressed dams. Just because you have more trees to kill, so you can have a higher amount of mortality, but also some of the stress, some of the trees in those dense dams might be more stressed. Um, but that, like everything in nature, is a little variable. Um, it turns out, and this is kind of something depressing actually, but it turns out there's a number of studies in the last few years that have shown that once beetles get in really large numbers and they switch from sort of the stress dead stands to the healthier trees, they actually do better um, because those healthier trees have better food availability. And so it's sort of the outbreak as it grows switches gears, if you will. Does that make sense? So it acts kind of like fire. Acts like fire. The beetle acts kind of like fire. And taking out a lot of trees? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, it's a natural disturbance. It's a natural disturbance. Yeah. It's just this one's not natural, natural because it's so big. So it's natural to not That's a big fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all natural disturbances, I think, that under certain circumstances they operate kind of the way our forests evolve. Mm -hmm. But if they get too far out of whack, then they can become damaging. And so now it's sort of hard to tell. Kind of what to think like, about. like if you took his his question, you know, and you put more natural disturbances on the landscape, you would have more diversity, and you would have less food source. And so that's not necessarily true, though, because if you increase the disturbance too much, you will start losing a lot of things that just can't maintain themselves in the face of that much disturbance. And so we see that in parts of California where the chaparral now burns, you know, with some of the fires, you know, every four or five years, when it was over 15, um, a lot of the plants aren't surviving. Um, and it kind of homogenizes those few that are just um, well evolved to deal with disturbance. So to keep the maximal disturbance out there, oh, I'm getting into dangerous territory here because this is something that people argue with in college all the time, but there's this kind of idea that intermediate amount of disturbance maintains the most complexity, that if you don't have disturbance, you move towards a situation where you lose a lot, but if you have too much disturbance, you lose stuff too much. And I think we're kind of moving towards too much disturbance with all the increases in beetles. You see the, the beetle is too much disturbance. Right now. Too, too yeah. but it, may be, it may be because of that suppression. But it's not, it doesn't follow the patterns of suppression. It follows patterns of climate. But the suppression can increase the severity, right? 
So some of the areas got hit harder because of those suppressed uh, Yeah, we're going to get a couple over here and come back. I don't know anything about that. No. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Ready. You had mentioned when uh, forests are attacked, they should be used to You mentioned that when uh, forests are attacked and die, that they tend to be clear cut, and you're advocating, and you're advocating some sort of selective uh, salvaging that leads to survivors. So has this been broached with the, either the Forest Service or private log holdings and what is their reaction to doing that? Um, I've talked to a number of people about it, but it's not just me that's thinking this. Um, the state of Montana, that's one of their recommendations is leave the green. And so it's something that people are kind of picking up on that, that there's some real value to leaving these green trees behind. So the state I know is doing that. I'm not so much sure about the Forest Service. Um, some of the people around Missoula that do some um, kind of private logging are doing that. <coughs> All right, a couple more. Um, when you have um, what? We can come back. Two more. spoke there were two natural defenses. One is the hypothesis about the genetic resiliency. They're still studying. And the other was dimension, size. Do you know the exact size where the beetle will not touch it? It varies from place to place because of the I'm not used to using a microphone. Um, it varies from size, uh, place to place what size of trees the beetles attack. Uh, and that's because it depends on the growth condition. So they have to get into the foam layer under the bark, and as a tree gets bigger, that foam layer gets thicker, and once it's big enough for them to fit in there, for some reason, that also means there's enough food for their young. And so at the site that we're studying, 20 centimeters is about the cutoff. Below that, you don't see beetles, and above that, you do. But if you go to another site that's, like if you go into one of these suppressed stands that, you know, is that really dense, uh, they might have to be a lot bigger because those trees have really thin foam and they're not doing so good. So it depends on the area, but in general, it's, you know, nine inches, I'm switching centimeters and inches here, um, keep people confused, but in general, bigger than that, but it is really going to depend on the stand. So is thinner foam a, 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 a good thing? If you're a tree, it is a good thing to avoid beetles, but it's not a good thing for a tree to grow and do well. But I mean, if you stay alive, you stay alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you're, you're always rickety. Wait, no, it's uh, interesting. We have always, uh, you know, um, and foresters have always thought, you know, the fastest growing trees were the most vigorous and the most able to defend themselves. And it may not be completely true. Um, Tom Swetman did a really cool study in Arizona um, where this, the, another outbreak, a beetle, pinion ips, has wiped out almost all the pines in the southwest already. This, the crabbiest, scraggliest trees were the ones that survived. They're just thinking about like the 10 foot white bark pine that are up by Kimla, you know? Yeah, they're not going to touch gotta be, that. They've got to be like paper thin, you know? Yeah, they are, and they don't, they don't get touched. Yeah. But the big juicy ones downstairs. Oh, yeah, so maybe now the really poor growing trees are going to be the survivors. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong side. <laughs> All right, one more. It's, it's actually going to be two more. I, I'm interested. Where have I seen you? Probably a few places. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in the breakdown of silos between scientific areas. And I'm just wondering, given white bark pine, 
not importance to grizzly bears. And to what extent you've had interaction with wildlife biologists in terms of that issue, the extent to which grizzly bears re rely upon white park pine, and also as you as you provided that map of British Columbia showing so much of the forest destroyed by beetles. Clearly, softwood lumber has been an issue recently in, in, in the news, and one would think that maybe BC was having a little less softwood lumber as a result of that, and yet it obviously is still having an impact on the American market. Any comments on interaction with the forest industry and your entomological work, or with the bear sector of our scientific community? Okay, the, the bear thing is, is very political, as you can imagine. Um, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, the grizzly bears there eat a lot of the white bark pine seeds, and that's one of the main foods of some of the females before they go in um, to hibernate, and when they fatten up on these seeds, it allows them to gestate their young better. And so they think it really helps support um, grizzly bear populations there. Uh, there's two camps. There is one camp that says that the decline in white bark pine is having big effects and that Fish and Wildlife Service is totally ignoring their own data and independent data. And then there's the Fish and Wildlife Service um, who claims that the white bark pine decline is having no effect and it's a big fight. And I have, I know people on both sides of that. Um, they have called on me a few times to speak to people in their behalf um, and take their sides, and I, I don't. Um, I have gone to Congress and um, talked to the Department of Interior and so forth and testified as to what's happening with white bark pine, but I have steered clear of the bear thing because I'm not an expert there. I do have my opinions, but I'm not going to share them. It is a really um, disturbing division that you see through the wildlife community right there because it is so strong and it's at the point where it's name calling and nobody is listening to each other. I think that's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, and the other one, oh the forest industry, as far as the software trade and all that, um, I, I don't really get involved too much in that. Um, a lot of the timber price issues that we've had and have been that there's a huge amount of wood coming this way from Canada, but slowed down a lot. They're shedding a lot of their super mills because they're out. You know, beetle kill only stays good for so long and they log heavily. The whole interior part is basically a massive clear cut and what they didn't cut, they burn. The BC? Yeah. They burn probably um, half of what was dead up there. The amount of carbon that was uh, released from the burning of these trees intentionally was on the order of what we release in a year anyway, um, with wildfires around the whole world. So it, it's been kind of a weird disaster up there. But as far as the software market, I just kind of stay out of that. Is there a, is there an effort to regenerate that in those genetically superior? Uh, no, I don't think they're, they don't consider genetics up there. Uh, most people don't. It's been too hard to do. And it still is. I think in the next few years, that will change. You think it'll change habitat types? You're breaking the rules. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're cut off. That'll be time for interaction after. I was just kidding. for a round of applause. That was an excellent talk. Well, wonderful job. Um, yeah, it's the least we could do, really. Yeah, wonderfully done. Um, once again, Roger, great question. It seems like every time we have a Science on Tap, he wins the Question of the Night Award. It's, it's time to let somebody else win it, okay? Um, I'll call for another round of applause. Great job. We, um, I think you said you'll work for beer, so there could be, if you have further <laughs> questions, I suggest you... are not a hard worker. <laughs> are you a hard drinker? I don't know. 
you can decide if you want to answer questions as they come up, I guess. But um, I really appreciate everybody coming out. A uh, great turnout for a great talk. Um, next month we have a uh, Laura Holmquist from the Montana Loon. Why don't you say? <laughs> She's a wildlife biologist for the um, Forest Service, and she'll be talking about moons in Montana next month. And while I have the mic, um, everyone I'm sure is expecting guests this summer, so please remind them to clean, drain, and dry their boat, please. Very, very important this summer. Thank you. Well done, Harry. Uh, so, yeah, next, next month's uh, talk will be here, and then the summer plans were still up for debate a little bit. They won't be at the brewery. It's a little too busy here for, for them to host us. No 4th of July event. So the second or the first Tuesday of the month. Yeah. The 4th of July is canceled this year. So, <laughs> I, I apologize. It's the way it is. Um, no, yep, we'll see. Uh, either way, uh, the summer's plans will be announced. Please check the Science on Tap Flathead.org website and we'll, we'll let you know. What we're hoping to do at this point is to try to move down to the south end of the lake for a couple events over the summer, um, at least one in August. Um, I'll, I'll leave, your, leave you salivating for what that's about, but it could be a really good event. Um, a different brewery, a different topic. Um, as she said, please stay vigilant about mussels in this area. If you see somebody putting a boat in, feel free to ask them if it's been inspected. Uh, feel free to make a stink and, and cause a scene. That's what needs to happen. Um, again, one last round of applause and thanks for coming to Central.